right. Your greeting and reach is actually extended across the world this morning. I want to show you guys a couple of pictures. This is our team in Mozambique. Well, they left for Mozambique and they're there. And I think we've got another one showing them with uh, all the kiddos. Yeah. Um, so yeah, isn't that awesome? So we're going to begin this morning just praying for them, uh, praying for our world, praying for, I don't know about you, but a little bit anxious in my heart as I'm watching what's happening just in our nation and thinking about things and trying to center myself in the gospel and find myself in the way of the Lamb, which requires me uh, to be, to find that place of the Prince of Peace, to find Switzerland um, and to know that he calls us higher and deeper. And so I love this. I love this, that we're there. Um, and that I know many of you uh, have a connection there as well. Some of you sponsor some of the kids um, every month so that they can not only have food and clothes, but also hear the gospel and go to school. And so just a beautiful thing, beautiful picture of reminder of why we're here, uh, what we're doing, that the gospel is to go to the whole world. And so we're going to pray for them and we're going to pray for our hearts this morning. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you. Uh, for our team in Mozambique, Lord. And I know those of us in the room right now uh, that have kids that we are connected to, that, uh, Lord, we gladly listen to your voice about our finances and have said yes to, I want to come alongside and to sponsor a child in Mozambique. And Lord, in the same way that we do that with um, other areas that you prompt us, Lord, we're so thankful to be called to a greater mission and vision, Lord, which is your kingdom spread across the whole world. Uh, Jerusalem was always meant to become the new Jerusalem, Lord, where you dwell with people. And so, Lord, um, oh Lord, I'm just listening to the rain. And I ask God for your spring of life, your river of living life, life, Lord, of water to come and to fall on us, to fall on those precious people in Mozambique. Lord, we need your life more than anything. And God, we, I think of uh, just the Psalm I was reading this week, one of my favorites, Lord, Psalm 130, out of the depths. I cry to you, O Lord. And if you kept a record of sins, who could stand? But with you, Lord, there is abundance, redemption and forgiveness. Our souls wait for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. And so Jesus, we just give you this time, Lord, we have to look to eternal truth. We have to look to the way you see the world. And we pray that as we study your word, as your spirit moves throughout this room, Lord, that we would hear your voice and we would follow. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 15 this morning, and you're going to notice something in the gospel of Matthew from, we're a little past halfway, um, that the book is going to turn dark. It's going to have this move towards the cross. And you may say, well, I know that. I, I, yeah, I, I know that. I've, I know that's what happens at the end. But do you know that that's what your life is called to as well? Do you know that the ever maturing, further in, further up life of a believer is to be one that has a progression of dying to self? of humility, of suffering for Christ and for his name. I resist that. I'll just tell you. <laughs> In my flesh, I resist that. And the title today, uh, well, that's just not how we do things, Jesus. That's just not how we do things. And you'll see this happen again and again as the stories unfold in Scripture. And I'm learning to read the Bible. I encourage you in your own journey with him to look at the surface of what's happening, but then also to go, what is, what is happening? Why are these stories where they are? 
And I've started to think about that with Matthew's gospel. And we're going to actually do a flyby of the whole chapter 15 this morning. Um, the reason is I've, I feel like the Spirit is beginning to teach me, um, knowing that, you know, we believe the Bible is the divine word of God, that it is verbally inspired, that it is authority, it's the only authority we have, and that God has used human authors, he used Matthew, one of his disciples, to write this gospel down, but that he made sure that the words we have and the order we actually have, why these three stories in this order this morning. I want you to be asking questions like that, not just what's happening on the surface. You'll, that's easy to pick out. That's easy to pick out this morning. You'll see it. It's like, oh yeah, this is, this is what's happening. I can see this. But why is Jesus putting these three together? Why in this order? What is he doing? How does it fit into what he is leading us toward? So we'll read the first. It's the longest section. It's 20 verses, 15 uh, verses 1 through 20. Holy Spirit, give us your heart. Help us hear your word this morning. Jesus was approached by Pharisees and scribes from Jerusalem. These are the Bible teachers. These are the professionals, okay, who asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, why do you break God's commandment? Because of your tradition. For God said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever speaks evil of father or mother must be put to death. But you say, well, whoever tells his father or mother, you know, whatever you got from me, whatever benefit you might have received from me is a gift committed to the temple. So just give you right away, this is a little legal loophole that they had. They're professional spiritual people and their parents are needing to be cared for. And it's in the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother, which implied taking care of them. And they're like, you know what? My time and my resources really need to go to God. And I know I was there. And so it's, so they're basically making a little loophole. That's what's happening here. Jesus knows it. Um, and he says, in verse six, he does not have to honor his father. So whatever benefit you might have received from me is a gift committed to the temple. In this way, you have nullified the word of God. You've taken the teeth right out of it. There's no stuffing left. It's nothing anymore because of your tradition, your spiritual, religious, churchy tradition. You have pulled the power right out of the word of God. And he says, mask wearers, mask wearers, actors, hypocrites. Isaiah prophesied correctly about you when he said, this people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain. Teaching his doctrines, human commands. Summoning the crowd, he told them, listen and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. His disciples came up to him and said, <clears throat> hey, did you know that they were kind of offended by what you said? <laughs> you gotta love the disciples. No, really? Jesus said, every plant that my heavenly father didn't plant will be uprooted. Leave them alone. They're blind guides. And if the blind guide the blind, both will fall into a pit. Oh, that's Clarifying, Jesus. Thank you. Uh, verse 15, then Peter said, can you actually tell us what you really meant when you said the thing you said? <laughs> That's what he's saying. There's so many times, like, can you just explain what you're saying? Do you still lack understanding, he asked. Don't you realize that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But what comes out of the mouth, what you say, the words that are formed from your thoughts, this, defiles a person. From the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual immoralities, thefts, false testimonies, slander. These are the things that defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands, that doesn't defile a person. So this tradition to wash your hands, where did it come from? They made it Super spiritual. Now, it came from the purification for priests before they were to go into the temple to perform their duties. God said, you need to have clean hands. You need to be purified and washed. But it wasn't for the sake of purification. This is not about hygiene, although 
there's an argument to be made that God was also helping them out with hygiene, but this was an outward symbol to represent what God wanted to do in the inside of a person. And so they said, well, that's good. That's good. The priest should wash their hands. You know what? Everybody should wash their hands. Everybody. In fact, hand washing is what makes us really shows us to be gods. So we're like, okay, hand washing. What else do we do? What outward things do you and I do to show spiritual status? to show that we really are God's people. It used to be, uh, it's just not as much of a thing anymore, but dressing up for church or not wearing a hat. Ironically for the Jews, wearing a hat is important when you read the word of God. (laughs) For us, we're like, how dare you wear a hat? And the Jews are like, how dare you not wear a hat? We're like, wait a minute, what's going on? But, and so that's not as much of a big thing right now, but for some people that was like, wow, you look great. You are showing your maturity in God. Other things, a little more simple, but some would say the types of songs you sing. Well, that song is not very biblical. Or that song is not one of the hymns, and so not as spiritual. I just really want the spiritual songs. Outward things. Let's go a little deeper, because Jesus says you're devaluing You're you're actually pulling out the power of God when you value tradition over God's word. He says, they honor me with their words, with what they say, but their heart is far from me. So we leave this building and the masks go off. When we're by ourselves at home, when we're with a coworker that we don't like, all of a sudden the outward stuff is just a show. Our words can be correct. You can say the right things. You can know the verses, but our hearts can be far from God. It's astounding to think about actually. What if God could see right now in this room, all of the thought bubbles above our heads? What if it was like, everybody be like, no. You're grabbing it and you're like, I'm not thinking about that right now. That's what Jesus is after. He's after all of you. Do you do the things of church and Christianity, but your heart truly belongs to you? Well, how do I know? Let's talk about an easy one first. Is your relationship with Jesus limited to one day? even one hour of the week. And do you think, well, that's pretty good. It's good enough. Lord, I wash my hands on Sunday. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? I wash my hands on Sunday. I get, I get all cleaned up. I actually remembered a scene from the movie Pearl Harbor years ago, um, which is a Michael Bay movie. If you know anything about Michael Bay movies, it's like... <laughs> rock music. And you know, it's just like, okay, this is Michael Bay. Transformers, he's another. But I remember this one scene. They're, they're going to church because it was on a Sunday, December 7th, 1941, right? Pearl Harbor Day. They're going to church and one of the people on the way, they're all dressed up and they're walking and this is awesome. This is awesome. And then this, this one person says, you know, I love going to church. I love getting all cleaned up. And then says, but I can't help thinking about how I'm going to get all dirty again. Do you just do it one day of the week? But is the reality that, because I'm not talking about going to church more either. Please, no. Please, no. (laughs) That's not what it's, that's not what I'm saying. It's not about quantity. It's about the quality of your worship. Are you captured by Jesus? Let's go deeper. Let's ask a more difficult one. How about, how about the people that you don't like, that you struggle with, whether that's just a coworker who's mean, somebody that you're not comfortable being around. What about somebody on the other side of the political aisle, somebody of another religion? What do you truly think about them? Do you hate them even a little bit? Jesus says, that's 
not a heart transformed. How about money? How you spend your money? How about what you will accept to make more money, even if it runs over people? Because forget them, right? Losers. But I wash my hand every Sunday. Even deeper, how do you deal with suffering? You're good with Jesus when it comes to great things happening in your life. If it goes well, then God is good. If it's bad, then he must be bad. These are questions we can ask that show whether or not we are just washing our hands, outward stuff. Because listen, the examples here are the professional followers of God, the Pharisees. Everybody measured themselves against them. But what they were doing was simplifying, reducing, pulling the stuffing out of the word of God. They were literally turning it into a bumper sticker. So God's word is ineffective. It's powerless. Even though they were the Bible thumpers of the day, Jesus says, it's not any good. This, this is the blind leading the blind. And I love his, this redirect when the disciples are like, don't you know you have offended them? He says, you know what? If God planted them, they'll stay. If not, phoom. remember the wheat and the weeds? If it's a planting of the Lord, it will endure. If God is at work, it will hold. If not, it will be pulled up. Your hands aren't the problem. It's your heart. It's a haunting thought that you can say and do all the right things, but your heart can still be far from God. Notice that Jesus puts in the same list words like this, evil, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, stealing. We're all like, yeah, yeah, yeah. False testimony, slander. You're like, no, well, wait a minute. He doesn't qualify and say, here's the first five. And you know what? These aren't as bad, but try better, try harder. He doesn't. They all defile. They're all in the same list. Doesn't matter what we do if our heart never changes. I'm going to say something. Jesus would rather you stop every single outward religious action done in hypocrisy and give him one moment of raw, honest, authentic conversation. Stop it. That's what he would say to us. Don't go to church. Don't give, don't worship, don't do this thing if you're not going to give me you. Well, Lord, I look good on the outside, but inside I'm a wreck. God wants more than clean hands. He wants more than pure thoughts. He wants more than church activity, which could lead us to say, well, I guess I give up then. I can't do this. Ah, right, right. How can a human heart be made pure then. It seems like I need something I can't do for myself. And you're on track if you start thinking that way. That's beautiful. That is the gospel path. But still, you may give yourself a pass. And they were giving themselves a pass here. The disciples are like, well, okay, at least we're not the Pharisees. At least we're not the Pharisees. At least we're not like them. We have this level. So let's look at the first, the next few verses See where Jesus takes them next. When Jesus left there, he withdrew to the area of Tyre and Sidon just then. Now this section of scripture, if it doesn't make you uncomfortable, you're not a human being, okay? It's gonna mess with you. It's, it's really, really difficult passage. Jesus seems to be a different person. Just then the Canaanite woman from the region came and crept crying out, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely tormented by a demon. Jesus ignored her. He didn't say a word. His disciples approached him and urged him, get her out of here. Send her away. She's crying out after us. So he finally replies, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came, knelt before him and said, Lord, help me. He answered, it isn't right uh -oh, to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. 
<gasps> oh no. Oh no. So you think maybe she'd just bail at this point. Yes, Lord, she said, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus replied to her, woman, your faith is great. Let it be done for you as you want. And from that moment, her daughter was healed. So this story should make you so uncomfortable. This, is, this should make you uncomfortable. On purpose, for many reasons, but let's walk through it and see what Jesus might be up to. It says they left there, which is Gennesaret. I'm going to show you a map real quick. It's kind of small, but you can see the colors at least. And the little tiny body of water up there, that's the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum is where Jesus did a lot of work. Gennesaret, it was actually just south on the west side. So green is good. Just think that. Green is good. This is Israel. This is, this is the Jews. These are the people we talk to. And so yellow is bad for Jews. They don't want to go up there. So where does he go? Up there. <laughs> He left there and he went to Tyre and Sidon. And these are not worshipers of God. These are worshipers of multiple gods, multiple gods. So already when they're walking north away from the green, the area that is the Jewish area, let's stay here. We don't like them. They're like, why do we have to go up here? Yeah, we don't want to. Jesus says, no, let's go. Let's take a walk. Let's head up to Tyre in Sidon. Why? Why are we going here? This is a simple question with a complicated answer. And this is what I want you to start asking when you look at a story like this. So obviously of the woman, what are we going to make of her? The disciples are just as much the target of Jesus in this story as the woman is, as are the Pharisees that he just left. Jesus is doing multiple things with multiple people all the time. So it, might, it may seem that originally the story was just about blind, hypocritical Pharisees, but it's just as much about these fledgling baby disciples who are learning from Jesus. And so going to Tyre and Sidon is not just about the woman, it's about them. It's about how they think about other people. So Jesus interacts with the people in the locations he travels to, but he is just as concerned with the growth of the disciples he is traveling with and the people he has walked away from. Get used to asking this question, Jesus, where are you taking me? It's a great question to ask right now in our country. What are you allowing? What are you doing? What are you stirring? This makes me uncomfortable. Ask those questions. So they're traveling. Let's just, let's talk about her for a second. She says, Lord, son of David, have mercy. That is a Jewish title coming from a woman who they, they worship multiple gods, multiple gods. So her knowledge of the Messiah of Israel is pretty astounding. So she's saying the right things. She's in a posture of worship. Son of David, have mercy. And her request is legitimate. Her daughter is severely tormented by a demon and she's coming to the one she thinks can help her. But Jesus ignores her. He ignores her. For once, he's doing what the disciples want. They're like, yeah, yeah, get. We don't, we don't want to interact with you. They weren't used to that. And so, and I, I imagine that one of the disciples kind of stepped in front and was like, mm-mm, mm, -mm, mm. Get. He, he doesn't want you. He doesn't want to talk to you. And then they say this, Jesus, send her away. And I think in his moment, in his mind, in the way God works, sometimes he waits to bring something to the surface from our heart before he acts. And so, yes, this is about her begging and about her persisting, but this is also about getting the disciples to this place where they're like, can you just send her away? And then Jesus is like, ding, ding, ding. Now we're ready. Everybody's in place. And so, because what is he doing? He is waiting until she cries out to bring out the problem, which is what? Racism, prejudice, lack of compassion. You know why they don't want to go there? They hate them. They hate them. 
They don't want to be around them. And so Jesus says, let's go. Let's go. They do not see her as a fellow image bearer of God. She is less than. And Jesus seems to be playing along with this. So I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So one little side note on the reliability of the Bible. How do you know it's true? How do you know it's historical? If you want to make something up, you leave this out. You leave this out. You don't tell this story about Jesus. It's too hard to understand. He seems with lack of compassion. You modify it at least to where he doesn't say the word dog in relation to another person. Or you don't show the God of the universe who has compassion ignoring somebody who just needs him to help. So that's just a side thing just to kind of put in your, if you ever wondered, like, how do I know this is true? That's one of the things that textual criticism looks at to say, well, this wouldn't be in here. You wouldn't unless it really happened. So while Jesus seems insensitive, he's actually being true to God's character and his promise, which is this. It starts with the Jewish people. They are chosen to be a blessing to the nations. Now they fail. They fail at this, which is why Jesus comes and says, I'm going to make good on God's promise. So you want a God who doesn't say, I am going to bless you. I am with you. I am making a covenant with you, Israel. And then all of a sudden he gets to earth and comes to fulfill the promises. And he's like, yeah, forget you guys, you're lame anyway. I'm going somewhere else. No, you want him to say, I'm coming to fulfill the promises that have been from the beginning about my chosen people, Israel. Yes, you want God to be true to his word, but there's more going on. Something else is happening here. Lord, help me. All right, she's on her knees, Lord. She's begging. Her daughter is hurting. Can you just do something just do something just to at least get this uncomfortable situation out of our way. It isn't right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. If somebody brings this up, if somebody brings up a difficult passage of scripture, you, you, sh- you can be comfortable also going, yeah, I know. Nah! Isn't that difficult? <laughs> That's a little tough to hear. But here's something, because what, what did they mean when they said, a person from Tyre or Sidon, Canaanite people, you're a dog. They, they used those, that term as a derogatory term. And what they meant was, it was a nasty insult to say you're wild, you're mangy, you're homeless, you're scavengers, get. That's what they meant. But wouldn't you know it, Jesus has changed the word just a little. And you know what he says? It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the puppies. Oh, the little dogs. Jesus is, believe it or not, being a little playful here. He is both acknowledging the fact that he knows the disciples and everybody else from Jerusalem calls them dogs, but then he's changing it because he's drawing out her faith. Doesn't mean we aren't uncomfortable with it. It still is uncomfortable, but it is what he said. And he knows what he's doing. What are you doing, Jesus? You know, I remember 9-11. I was in Knoxville and I remember going to church. I was a youth pastor then. And there was a guy that was in the office and it was like a day or two after, which... If you were alive at that point, we were all pretty amped up, weren't we? (laughs) We were all ready. I was glued to the TV. You know why? I wanted to see bombs dropped. That's what I was thinking. It's like, get them. And this guy came into the church and I remember because I was torn and he said this and it just, it exposed, I think, not just what was going on in my heart, but I think how we see people in the world. And it was like, this was not like out at a workplace or in a bar. This was in a church. And I remember he said, I don't care if they bomb the whole place and turn it into a parking place, parking lot. And I was like, 
wow. But that was not an uncommon thought. It wasn't. It's still not. Is this a problem? It is, isn't it? It is. It's, it's easy to find that stirred up in us. And the disciples aren't idiots here, as Jesus points this out, of how they think about the Canaanites. They know what they call the Gentiles. They're aware of the racial slurs they use. And so Jesus essentially has brought up a conversation at dinner that you don't talk about at dinner. We don't, we don't talk about that, Jesus. The woman responds and doesn't leave. She persists. She won't give up. She actually disagrees with Jesus. Yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. This is incredible depth and understanding of what is needed in her heart, in the life of her daughter who is suffering. And this is the moment when Jesus says, you got it. Great faith, let it be done for you. So I'm not letting you go until you bless me. So I just have to know something, Lord. Does God have any crumbs for me? These are my pups. <laughs> this is Nash and this is Jake. And they are good beggars. <laughs> they are really good at coming right up under your feet and they know that they know you have something good and you will give it to them <laughs> eventually. And we do, we do. They're like, Nash is tall enough that he can actually come and he, doesn't he look human? It really bothers me, his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> this is in the kitchen. He's like, I'm just here hanging out. Just, you know, same thing with Jake. Like as soon as you sit down, it's like, okay, I'm here. Nope, I'm just, and Jake will do this thing where he'll get under the table and we're eating. And he's like, Jake's old, he's like 13 years old, and he'll go get a toy, one of Nash's toys. And all of a sudden he'll start like running around. And he's like, I'm a real dog, I'm a real dog. Give me some food. Because he knows the character of the people that, who we are. They know that we will give. And this is essentially, Jesus is, I love this about him. I love trying to be just being messed with in my own hearts, but will God give for us, will he care for us? Yes, he will. <laughs> yes, he will. She may not have understood everything about God, but one thing was clear. She was out of options and Jesus seemed to be the only one left with bread. The only one who could truly do something. That's a good place to be. Of all the options she has, she picks Jesus. Last few verses. Where is Jesus taking us? uncomfortable places. That's not how we do things, Jesus, but it is how he does things. Moving on from there. And just a little side note, three simple pictures. Hand washing before eating, crumbs falling from the table. And now, moving on from there, Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee. He went up on a mountain <clears throat> and sat there. This sounds familiar. He's done this before. Large crowds came to him, including the lame, the blind, the crippled, those unable to speak, and many others. And if you're thinking about the passage in Isaiah about the Messiah, that's a good thought because that's what Matthew's trying to do again. They put them at his feet. He healed them. The crowd was amazed when they saw those unable to speak, talking, the cripple restored, the lame walking, the blind seeing, and they gave glory to the God of Israel. Why say it that way? Because he's not their God. They're not Israelites. Keep reading. Jesus called his disciples and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they've already stayed with me three days, have nothing to eat. I don't want to send them away hungry. Otherwise they might collapse on the way. Disciples said to him, where could we, <laughs> it's only been like a chapter that this has happened. Where could we get enough bread in this desolate place to feed such a crowd? Uh, you, Jesus has to be like, <laughs> come on y'all. We just did this like yesterday. How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked them. Seven, they said, and a few small fish. After commanding the crowd to sit down on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish, gave thanks, broke them, gave them to the disciples. Notice his involvement of the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. I bet they would have rather not. 
knowing who was here. They all ate and were satisfied. They collected the leftover pieces, seven large baskets full. Now there were 4,000 men who had eaten besides women and children. After dismissing the crowds, he got into the boat, went to the region of Magadan. Now you may think, I've already heard this story. Maybe this is a textual error and they're just repeating the story. 5,000, 4,000, like really similar stuff. Isn't this just maybe like somebody heard the story and mixed it up a little bit? Now there's two. It's on a mountain, healing the multitudes. I think I've heard that one too. Muter speaking, crippled, restored, lame, walk, blind, see. This is, yeah, another declaration of Jesus as the Messiah. Compassion on the crowds, wants to feed them. You would think it's just a repeat. Why is he saying this? Just to show that God can do this whenever he wants? Maybe there's a little bit of that. Just to talk about the way that Jesus can provide and wrongly interpreting a Bible verse or a passage like this goes something like this, 5,000, 4,000. God provides, God blesses, God can multiply. Well, if I'm going to go four, five, I'll go five. I want 5,000. Lord, I want, I want a 5,000 multiplication blessing in my life, in my business. Multiply the fishes and loaves and money. And we do this. We, we take this to just be like, God will provide. That's all he's saying. God will provide. It's not all he's saying. This is new for me to see some of these stories because I would have years ago just looked, oh yeah, there's another, Jesus is amazing. He can do fish and bread anytime he wants. But we miss something. So let's go back to the map. All right, so we were up there, Tyre and Sidon. They left there and they go to this other yellow place, the Decapolis, also bad, also not where they want to be. And before Jesus did the 5,000 miracle in the green area. He does the 4,000 miracle in the yellow area. So wash your hands before you eat. If you want to be pure before God, if you want to partake of who God is, wash your hands before you eat. Jesus is like, you guys. And then he goes to a Gentile woman in Tyre. And she's begging for crumbs. She knows God has something. And now here we are also in a Gentile area. And Jesus is like bread for everybody. Bread for everybody. We don't want to miss what Jesus is doing. And I think the disciples are uncomfortable here. I think they say, send them away, not just because they don't know how God's going to do it. I think they kind of do. You know why they want, he wants them to send them away? Because they don't want to be here anyway. We don't want to be around these people. <laughs> Same thing he did with the woman at the well. Anytime you go through Samaria, anytime you go through these places that we don't like, you'll see it later in the book of Acts when it's like you need to minister to the Gentiles. No, we don't want to. Peter, yes, I'm giving you this vision. Yeah, but I am afraid to do this. I don't like this. We don't like them. Jesus, this is not how we do things. Send them away. Here's the problem with thinking this way. From the beginning, we're going to go back to this again, Israel chosen to be a blessing to themselves, to keep it to themselves. No, from the beginning to the nations. What does God say to Abraham? I will bless you so that you can bless the nations. This is the plan. This is God. So let me take another verse and give you a, a similar way that somebody might take it. It's a famous one. You'll hear it often. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Anybody heard that one? Anybody heard that one applied to America? Yeah, of course. Of course. And I don't think it's a bad thing to apply to all of the world at some point, the concepts and the truth. That is definitely, you can do this with God's word. But you first have to understand who it was written to and in what context. This was during the reign of Solomon. And God said to them, listen, if you'll, if you'll stay humble, if you'll follow me, if you'll turn from your wicked ways, I will forgive and I will heal. And anybody knows a little bit of Bible history knows that, did they? No, they went into exile. That promise 
didn't happen, Israel, if Israel stays, if Israel is faithful, if Israel turns from their wicked ways, and so for us just to lop it off is the same as saying, I want the blessing of 5,000. We just, yes, this is what you're doing. This is what you're doing, God. But God's promises are fulfilled in Jesus. He is the son of David. He is the Messiah. He is the chosen one of Israel who does live faithful to the covenant, who does take on the punishment and the wickedness of the world for the disobedience of Israel to break the covenant. So let's, if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn, I will hear and I will forgive and I will heal. He humbled himself. He became obedient to death. He took our wickedness on himself. He walked a life of faithfulness to his father. He sought him on our behalf. And because of his obedience, God hears and forgives. All of this, Luke 24, Jesus tells us directly, all of this must be seen through him. And it isn't that we can't pray for God to heal our land. Of course we can. Of course, but it must come through Jesus. It must come through his way. This verse isn't about America. Its original context is Israel to bless the nations. Jesus fulfills that and makes it possible. And Jesus is healing and feeding people on the other side of the lake, the enemy side. Why? Because Jesus has broken bread for broken people. So we go from washing your hands before you eat to crumbs falling from the table to bread for everyone. And you're like, Matthew, what are you doing? Holy Spirit, what are you doing putting these stories together? And then you start going, I see, I see. He is the bread of life come down from heaven for all nations to be broken. Does God have crumbs for the outcast, the wanderers, the scattered and the broken? Because of Jesus, more than enough. Yes, yes, my little pups. I love you. Here, eat from my table. So right now, people are taking sides. And I want to say this, I wasn't here last week, so I wasn't able to do this, but we can look at the events of last Saturday, an attempted assassination on former President Trump and the man that died protecting his daughters and his wife and the other two that were injured. We can look at it and we can say that is evil. Romans 12, 9, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. And while we may want to say, well, now more than ever, that really makes me want to pick sides. That really makes me want to point out who is I'm against. And we do need to take sides. But as my friend and you're all's friend as well, some of you that you know him, Brandon said this past week, I have picked a side. It is the side of the lamb. It is the side of the Prince of Peace. It doesn't mean everything's easy to figure out. It's a really hard time right now. It's a really hard time. But we have to pray. We have to go where Jesus takes us, which is uncomfortable place, and listen to his heart, listen to his voice. And when we push back to say, that's not how we do things, we would rather you do it this way, we follow. We follow in humility, we listen. I'm going to ask the worship and the prayer team to come forward and give you a a few categories um, because there's one thing you can do. If you're like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to live. I don't know how to speak. There's one thing you can always do and that's pray. And honestly, I think it's the most um, protected place for you and your walk with Jesus. It's the one where he can, you can interact directly with him But let me just give you a few things as you think about the stories that we read this morning. Have you merely been doing the outside stuff, but inside you're a mess? Outside doesn't match inside. 
Jesus can fix that. Jesus can fix that. I encourage you to come forward for prayer. Was your first response last Saturday or maybe this week as you read news stories or hung around on, hung out on Twitter or things like that to pick your side and to see the other side as less than human, not an image bearer? Are you weary, afraid, anxious, and struggling to see others the way Jesus does? He can fix that. Come forward. If you feel a pressure on your chest, almost literally like, a, a, like God's hand is pressing on you or he's tugging and drawing and pulling out things in your life and doing it through difficulty, maybe not saying what you want him to say, maybe seeming a little... I don't know, insensitive with the stuff he's allowing. Not answering in the kind and compassionate way that you think he should, but maybe he's drawing you out. Maybe he's looking for a little persistence, pressing in. Take a next step and come forward and pray about that. If you need physical healing today, we have many in our body right now, different stories. Many of you are connected to them, um, walking through cancer, loss, just getting old. I know I'm only 52, but man, I'm watching things happen around me. I'm, I'm seeing family members and people that I was so used to seeing are now gone. It's hard, isn't it? There's parts of life sometimes where you're just like, ah, Lord, this is really difficult. Come. Lean into those things in prayer. If you're lonely today, experience, I experience, a, sometimes I feel like it comes in waves. This past week, incredible loneliness. Incredible loneliness heaviness in my heart. So what do I do? I run to Jesus. I run to him. I ask for help. I encourage you to come forward. Those that are on your mind right now, family members or friends who are maybe just very persistent in their rejection, even angry about it, think you're such a fool, or maybe they're just in that razor thin place of between belief and doubt and unbelief, come and pray for them. Come and pray for them. And then as we always say, come because you don't know why, but because you sense that God is after you. Lord, we, we want to be led by you. And Lord, in our flesh, we don't want to be led by you. We dislike the places that are uncomfortable. We would like for things to be easier and just, I don't know, just spelled out. And God, I'm sure the disciples would have been just so content for you never to go to Tyre or Sidon or the Decapolis or Samaria. And God, I think we could say the same things about many situations and people. But Lord, you're, you're so true to who you are, your compassion for all people, but you loved the world that you gave. So Holy Spirit, we just tithe our time here just for a few minutes. And Lord, maybe if we're used to keeping you uh, at bay with all of our outward activity, if we're used to kind of protecting that inner deep place of our hearts, Lord, we welcome you in now. We welcome you in. And we also pray for the power to break into um, closed off places. Would you stir your people, Lord? Would you stir those who you want to know that you want them as your people? I'll give you this time, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing. And if you would like prayer, please come forward.